In this video, we're going to learn about the history of the Korean Peninsula in brief and then what are the geopolitical factors that drives North Korea's behavior. Let's look at the Korean Peninsula first. This is North Korea, capital of North Korea's Pyongyang. North Korea and China share almost 1500 km long border. In the south, there is South Korea, capital of South Korea's Seoul. Now this entire piece of landmass, that is North Korea plus South Korea, together is called the Korean Peninsula. As you may know, the definition of peninsula is a landmass that is surrounded by water on three sides. On the left side, you have the Yellow Sea. On the right side, you have the Sea of Japan. And on the extreme southern end, you have the East China Sea. North Korea also has a small border with Russia, both on land as well as water. And here is Japan. Now this entire Korean peninsula has been a hotbed of geopolitical tensions for decades, almost 70 years now. And even today, the situation remains volatile. Let me also give you some more information about South Korea and Japan. After that, we will learn about North Korea's behavior. The first thing that you need to understand is that South Korea and Japan, they are allies of the United States. Here are some of the major US military bases in South Korea. This is not the entire list. There may be additional US military installations. Nevertheless, these are the major ones. And here are some of the major US military bases in Japan. Even this is not the entire list. There may be additional US military installations. Nevertheless, these are the major ones. With these many US military bases, you can imagine how much United States involvement exists near the Korean Peninsula. So in a way, we can also say that South Korea and Japan rely heavily on United States for military, economic and diplomatic support. Although South Korea and Japan do have their own military forces, but then it is the US military that provides advanced technology and equipment. Then South Korea and Japan are both major trading partners with the US and the US provides economic assistance and support to help these countries develop economically. So let me repeat again, South Korea and Japan, they heavily rely on United States for military, economic and diplomatic support. I'm not saying they are entirely dependent on the US, I'm saying heavily. If you look at the entire Korean Peninsula before 1945, that is end of World War II, the entire peninsula was a single unified Korea ruled by a king. In other words, there was only one Korea. The last king of Korea was Emperor Shunjong from the Yi dynasty, who ruled from 1907 until 1910. Then in 1910, Japan annexed Korea with its military strength. If you know, even Japan had a monarch. They still have an emperor, but then it is symbolic. So after 1910, Korea was a colony of Japan till 1945 when Japan was defeated in World War II. If you remember World War II, it was fought between the Axis powers and the Allies. Axis powers lost. Likewise, in this region, Japan lost. The Allies, mainly United States and the Soviet Union, agreed to divide Korea into two occupation zones. They divided Korea at the 38th parallel of latitude north of the equator. Soviet Union took the northern part and the United States took the southern part. Although this division and occupation was supposed to be temporary, but then as you know, Cold War started between United States and Soviet Union. And it was the Cold War that was the reason why Korea never became one single country. In 1948, the Republic of Korea was established in the South, while the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was established in the North. Since North Korea was under the shadow of Soviet Union, North Korea became a communist state. In 1950, communist North Korea attacked South Korea, which resulted in the Korean War. It lasted for three years from 1950 to 1953. Communist China and Soviet Union both supported North Korea. And on the other hand, United States came in support of South Korea. This Korean War was also called the first recorded war of the Cold War. On July 27, 1953, ceasefire was eventually reached, but no peace treaty was signed. And since then, both the Koreas have remained technically at war. So this was a brief history of the Korean Peninsula. And then you also know the story of Japan. When United States dropped atom bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, after that United States occupied Japan from 1945 till 1952. It was the United States who set Japan to be a peaceful country. And that is how the Article 9 was added to their constitution that says, war is not an option for Japan to settle international disputes. In simple words, it prohibits Japan the use of force. It also prohibits Japan from maintaining armed forces. And it also denies Japan the right of belligerency, which means Japan cannot act aggressively. This is where you have to understand that Article 9 of the Japanese constitution was imposed by the United States after World War II in 1947. 
Any how Japan and South Korea are vassal states of the United States. A vassal state means that a country will have some degree of independence in its internal affairs, but largely their foreign affairs are dominated by another state. Now on the other hand, North Korea and China they both have nuclear weapons and they also have a large standing army. North Korea conducted its first nuclear test on October 9, 2006, and China became a nuclear power in 1964. So if you look at this part of the Asia Pacific region you will realize that South Korea and Japan these two countries face security threats from North Korea and China and this gives the United States the much needed reason to make its presence available in this region by establishing military bases in South Korea and Japan as i said North Korea conducted its first nuclear test in 2006 immediately after that in the same year the United Nations Security Council imposed the first set of sanctions on North Korea Here is the entire list of UN sanctions on North Korea. Apart from United Nations Security Council, individual countries and organization have also put sanctions on North Korea. Here is the list. If you keep aside Japan and South Korea, United States and European Union, they together are called as the West. That means the entire West is against North Korea. Now what is the point of putting sanctions if they are not properly monitored or enforced? Sanctions are only effective if they are properly monitored and enforced. In the case of North Korea, United Nations, United States and its allies, they all have established mechanisms to monitor and enforce these sanctions. So there are a couple of things that United States does. Number 1. You must have heard about the Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, which is part of the US Department of Treasury. So what this agency does is it monitors and investigates activities of the targeted foreign country, individual or any entity that may violate the US sanctions. OFAC collects and analyzes data from various sources. It also does intelligence gathering by collaborating with other countries government agencies and then it also has the power of freezing assets and transactions. So this is one way United States monitors sanctions. The second way is United States uses its navy and air force to physically monitor and enforce economic sanctions. The US Air Force and Navy conducts surveillance and reconnaissance missions around the Korean Peninsula within the international water to monitor the sanctions on North Korea. Now when I say the United States conducts surveillance and reconnaissance missions within the international waters, this statement looks good on face value. In reality, we will never know whether or not US violates the maritime law. After all entering in the enemy territory is very much part of intelligence gathering. I'll give you an example. In 1968 North Korea captured a US Navy warship called US Pueblo which was a intelligence gathering ship near the Korean Peninsula. Although it is said that the US Navy intelligence ship was operating in international waters, but North Korea even today has that ship and they have put it on display highlighting United States propaganda tool. and all the us crew members were kept in jail for 11 months and they were released only when the us government signed a statement acknowledging that the ship had entered the north korean waters now this example tells us that united states will break the law if they have to so if you look at this korean peninsula if at all any ship or any aircraft has to move out of north korea it can either go from left or right from both ways united states and its allies can keep an eye on it Then the question comes who is doing trade with North Korea who is supporting North Korean economy despite numerous sanctions This is where you have to understand that North Korea's biggest trade partner is China after China it is Russia and these three countries do not have to use the sea route they have land border whatever they do in this region United States and its allies cannot take the risk of flying over the country and get a glimpse of it because North Korea has deployed KN06 surface to air missile system at several locations which are not publicly known in addition to this North Korea has developed and deployed various other missile systems including ballistic missiles cruise missiles and anti ship missiles as part of its overall military capabilities so North Korean economy is breathing only because of China and then Russia China is a major source of food fuel and other resources for North Korea China also provides significant economic assistance to North Korea including direct aid and investment in the country's infrastructure mining and other industries Similarly the majority of North Korea's exports go to China which includes mineral textiles and seafood North Korea also has limited trade relationships with Russia it is not as significant as that of China Russia has also provided food and medical aid to North Korea and has also invested in specific industries such as mining and energy Then Russian companies have also provided some transportation services to North Korea particularly through the Trans-Siberian Railway. 
Apart from trade, North Korea is a highly self-reliant country, which is also their founding philosophy. North Korea's economy is often described as a highly centralized economy in which the government controls most economic activity and resources. Now, this ideology or philosophy establishes the importance of national sovereignty and independence, which is actually a good thing. Being self-reliant is not at all a bad thing. In Hindi, we call it Atmanirbhar. Then, North Korea has a reputation of producing skilled scientists and engineers, particularly in fields such as computer science, engineering and weapons development. This is because, again, the country has a highly centralized education system, with a focus on science and technology, and the government provides significant resources to support research and development in key industries such as weapons development and military technology. Now, you combine this philosophy of self-reliance, and then look at their trading partners, and North Korea's active military strength of over 1.2 million soldiers, you will find your answer as to how North Korea is defending itself and how its economy is still breathing despite so many international sanctions. Now let's address the main question, what are the geopolitical factors driving North Korea's behavior? What you need to understand is that North Korea views the United States and its allies such as South Korea and Japan as a threat to its national security, its culture and its heritage. North Korea has a long-standing animosity towards Japan, which goes back to Japan's colonial rule over Korea from 1910 to 1945. During this period, Japan imposed a number of harsh policies on the Korean people, including restriction on their language, culture and political activities, as well as forced labor and sexual slavery. And as I've said, it was due to Japan's defeat in World War II, Korea got divided into two parts. Even today, North Korea blames Japan for being the initial catalyst in breaking Korea's national and cultural heritage into two different parts. Now coming to South Korea, although both the countries speak Korean language, but there are some differences in the pronunciation, vocabulary and grammar. North Koreans use more traditional vocabulary which is more respectful, while South Koreans use a modern and simplified language. You can also see their clothing and lifestyle. South Korea is generally considered to be more trendy and fashion conscious than North Korea. South Korea is known for its vibrant and dynamic pop culture, including K-pop music, dramas and movies, which have gained popularity around the world. South Korean fashion, makeup and skincare trends are also highly influential in the global market, with brands like K-beauty and K-fashion gaining popularity. You will not see all this in North Korea. Now compare both countries' soldiers and you will notice the difference. So all this trendiness and modernness of South Korea is coming due to heavy American cultural influence, particularly in terms of popular culture and entertainment. American music, movies, TV shows and fashion have been popular in South Korea for decades and many South Koreans are familiar with American celebrities and trends. American companies such as McDonald's, Starbucks and Coca-Cola are also well established in South Korea and many South Koreans consume American products and brands on a regular basis. These are American soft power. And you very well know that the ultimate goal of soft power is to influence the opinions, beliefs and behaviors of people slowly without any force. Although one may say there is no harm in eating McDonald and having coffee at Starbucks, but slowly over a period of time, these soft power tools ultimately become tools of subversion. In North Korea, all these things are banned because North Korean regime does not want their citizen to get exposed to such kind of American belief system. And that is why North Korea views nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles as the only way to counter any kind of potential aggression from the US and its allies, be it in the form of hard power or soft power. Ultimately, the purpose of developing nuclear weapons is not to keep it in a showcase. As Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam once said, strength respects strength. So this is what is driving North Korea's behavior. And now that North Korea's economy has been heavily sanctioned by international community, due to which North Korea already has limited access to foreign capital and goods. Now that further justifies North Korean policy of pursuing nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles as a way to increase their bargaining power in securing some economic concessions. If you look at the list of North Korea's missile tests in last 10 years, here's the list, pause the video and have a look at it. In fact, last year in 2022, North Korea has test-fired more than 30 missiles, which includes short, medium and long-range ballistic missiles. And then last year in September, North Korea has officially declared itself as a nuclear weapon state. And they have also clearly stated that they will never abandon their nuclear weapons because they need it to counter the United States. In fact, there are reports which says that North Korea has plans of conducting more nuclear tests. That also clearly means that North Korea not only wants to have nuclear weapons, but they also want to keep upgrading their nuclear technology so that they have the edge. 
Now, if you look at the missiles that North Korea has been testing, they include cruise missiles, hypersonic missiles, and wide range of ballistic missiles. On October 3, 2022, North Korea had conducted a long range missile test that flew over Japan and landed in the Pacific Ocean. The last time anything like this happened was in 2017. The name of that missile was Hwasung 12. It is North Korea's medium range ballistic missile, which has a range of 4,500 kilometers, that is far enough to hit the US island of Guam from North Korea. The speed of this missile was 17 Mark. So, it is very clear that the reason behind North Korea's nuclear ambition is United States of America. And I also want you to pay attention, while testing so many missiles, North Korea has scared South Korea and Japan, but it has never harmed or fired the missiles directly into their territories. This is called muscle flexing. North Korea fires a missile once in a while just to scare the countries in this region. And then automatically we see that United States, South Korea and Japan, they will start conducting military drills, which works both as a preparation and as a response. And the fact of the matter is that the joint effort of United States, South Korea and the Japanese government has become less effective against North Korea's offensive posture. And economic sanctions are not turning out to be effective on North Korea. This is everything you had to know about North Korea and the geopolitics of the Korean Peninsula. I hope you find this video informative. Thank you for watching it.